In this video, I'm going to be going over the worst, most dangerous foods for low thyroid and hypothyroidism, part two, and I'm going to be explaining why these foods are so potentially bad for you and what you need to do about it. So just like in our last video, which I'll link to here, this is based on some research from a few years ago, and it really focuses on something called cross-reaction. Cross-reaction occurs when your immune system makes antibodies for one thing that can stick onto another thing. Uh, sometimes it's called molecular mimicry, uh, sometimes it's called like epitope mimicry, but the point is, is your immune system makes an antibody for something that is able to stick on something else because they're very uh, molecularly similar. Now in our last video we focused on foods that can cross-react with T4 and why that's so dangerous for hypothyroidism. This video is focusing on the foods that can cross-react with T3, right, or triiodothyronine. So just remember there's a couple different causes of hypothyroidism. There's autoimmune hypothyroidism, which is the most common, which is Hashimoto's, and then there's non-autoimmune. Now in both conditions you pretty much always end up having to take uh, T4 and or T3 uh, because you just don't make enough hormones. So you can imagine if your immune system is making antibodies to a food that can now stick to your T3 and or T4, then your T3 levels can drop so that you may not get the benefit of the cytomel you're taking or your hypothyroidism symptoms can just get a lot worse. So remember, there's a whole list of hypothyroid symptoms. Most common are things like hair loss, weight gain, anxiety, depression, brain fog, uh, muscle and joint pain, constipation, uh, those sort of things. And these foods that we're going to talk about here can make those symptoms uh, worse. Now, hold on, don't like, don't make a list and think, oh my god, I've got to get rid of all these foods right now because that's not exactly what I'm saying. But let's go ahead and jump into the list of the foods. Now, in this research, they classified these foods based on like a 2 plus and a 3 plus and a 1 plus based on how cross-reactive those foods were. So we're going to go over just the 2 plus and the 3 plus. So this is the, the medium cross-reactive foods with T3. So here we go. Uh, roasted almonds, barley, cashews, roasted cashews, cashew vacillin, which is a piece of cashew, chocolate, cow's milk, cooked egg yolk, gelatin, macadamia nuts, raw and roasted, uh, millet, which is a grain, peanut butter, roasted peanuts, rye, cooked shrimp, spelt, another grain, and raw tuna. Now, if you watched the last video, and I'll link to that, you're going to see a few common themes. A few things that were on that list are on this list too. So that was the medium cross-reactors, the things that if you eat them and develop a problem with them, those antibodies can now go after your T3 and make your thyroid symptoms worse. So here is the uh, cross-reactors with T3 that are 3 plus, or a high level of cross-reactivity. Amaranth, buckwheat, coffee, corn, hemp, camet, uh, uh, latex, havian, I never knew how to pronounce that, uh, latex, havian, macadamia nuts, raw and roasted, millet, peanut butter, roasted peanuts, potato, quinoa, rice, cooked scallops, seaweed, sorghum, cooked squid, tapioca, and tofu. Again, you're going to see a few... Um, uh, duplicates from the last list when we talked about T4. Now on this list you can see what do we got here mainly with a lot of different grains, right? We've got things like amaranth and buckwheat and camut and, and hemp. And so again, what are you going to do with this information? Well, what you can't do, and I don't want you to do this, is to go and say, well, I'm going to eliminate all these foods. Okay, for how long? <laughs> Do you ever reintroduce them? Don't try to DIY this. I'm, you're going to have to find someone that already knows about this information and knows the specific diet changes and the specific diet plan uh, that you'll need to follow to find out if these are a problem. But the other thing you have to realize is for these things to be a problem, you're going to have to have developed a hyper leaky gut, right? And you may have heard of that. I use the word hyper leaky because your gut is naturally physiologically healthily leaky that's how things get across your gut barrier but when you're hyper leaky it means that the bricks lining your GI tract have either been busted or the mortars loose if you will and things that are too big or things that shouldn't get across are getting across and your immune system is sitting right there to make some antibodies to them so what causes a hyper leaky gut there's 50 different things that can do that just having Hashimoto's can do that. Having any inflammatory condition can do it. You could have a bacterial overgrowth, you could have uh, a candida overgrowth, you could have a vitamin D deficiency. Uh, you, there's a, so many different things that can make you have a hyperleaky gut. So just taking these foods and saying, oh, I'm just going to eliminate all these, 
Well, that kind of ignores the deeper fact that if one of these is a problem, it's a problem because you've got a hyperleaky gut and that's going to have to get fixed or you're probably going to get this problem all over again. Now, the other thing you can't do, and I know this is going to maybe make a lot of people mad and I probably shouldn't say it, but don't waste your time doing IgG food sensitivity testing for this stuff because that, that testing, and I'll keep it simple, does not tell you what you think it tells you. Basically, what's going to show up on there is all the stuff that you normally eat. Right? And there's going to be some stuff that shows up on there that you've never eaten and don't eat. And that food, that, that test can really only tell you that you've got some sort of hyperleaky gut. Uh, if the food shows up positive, it doesn't mean it's causative, which is something I learned a long time ago. And I uh, recently heard someone say, and I was like, thank you for someone else saying that. So anyway, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to work with someone that understands all the stuff we just talked about and understands the diet plan necessary, understanding how to find out if you've got hyperleaky gut, how do you reintroduce these foods. But here's the caveat I want you to walk away with. Just because these things can cross-react, and we know it from these, this research, it doesn't mean that they're going to cross-react or that they're guaranteed to cross-react in every person. But I can tell you, in my practice over the last 20 years, work, 20 years working with people with Hashimoto's, working with people with non-Hashimoto's hypothyroidism, food reactivity is a very real thing, but there's no point in doing IgG food sensitivity testing for it. You can do a much better approach uh, doing a specific sort of diet plan as part of an overall strategy to get to the bottom of what's really causing uh, the root uh, issues. So with that in mind, I'm going to uh, post the list here again on an image as we close out the video. And yeah, I just need you to work with someone that understands these things because uh, it gets pretty complicated. All right, I'll see you next time.